Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Ki Tetzeh, beginning in Deuteronomy, the book of Devarim, chapter 21, verse 10. The Torah portion, named for the first words with which it begins, opens with the commandments relating to the Eshet Yafat Tor, the attractive captive woman taken in battle. This unusual commandment is interpreted in different ways that cover the gamut of possibilities ranging from the basest level of human failing to the noblest possibility of human potential for redemption. For as we have learned, the concept of permitting the attractive captive woman to a soldier can be seen as the Torah's accommodation to a soldier's lust, allowing him to marry her in a permissible manner so as not to sin. But on the other hand, it's also interpreted for example, according to Rabbi Chaim ben Attar, the famed Or HaChaim, the Light of Life commentary, in a diametrically opposite fashion, namely, that having risked his life for his people in this war, in this merit, the Israelite soldier is filled with an overwhelming spirit of holiness, which affords him an almost prophetic spiritual insight into the inner essence of this woman, and what he craves is not her physical form at all, but to connect with her soul. And that's the opening of our Parsha. Interestingly, this fits right in with the themes of this month of Elul, as we have already mentioned. The names of the Torah portions always read during this month of Elul, beginning with Parshat Shoftim, you shall appoint judges and officers in your gates. These reflect the spiritual goals of this period. Rashi explains that this war in the beginning of our Parsha, regarding the attractive captive woman, it's a milchemet reshut, it's an optional war, a war that could be fought by everyone all the time. And we note that this verse is in the singular, when you shall go out to war against your enemy, your own private enemy. Many of our classic commentaries interpret this in a homiletical vein, that when you will go out to war against your own evil inclination, greatest enemy of all, apropos for Elo, are you le looking deeply for holiness? Or are you merely being tested by the basest aspect of your own sworn enemy, your own personal evil inclination? After all, Elul is all about the war that we all wage constantly against our own evil inclination. But there are so many mitzvot, divine commandments, in this Torah portion. In fact, you know, more mitzvot are given over in the parsha of Kitetze than any other Torah portion. The portion of Mishpatim has 53. Parashat Kedoshim features 51. But our portion of Ki contains a whopping 74 commandments, 27 positive, 47 negative. So, since Parashat Ki is so full of commandments, and so timely, here in the month of Elul, as we all seek to improve our relationship with each other, and our relationship with Hashem, let's focus a little bit on the commandments of the Torah, the concept of the commandments, and what they mean to us. I mean, the 74 mitzvot in our parsha are so varied. Does anything connect them? And why did God give the people of Israel so many commandments anyway? And just learning to understand the significance of all the commandments in Parshat Ki this week's Torah portion, be a lifetime of study. Now, you know, for the past several weeks, as we've been studying the book of Devarim, we have had occasion to speak a great deal about what the past several parshiot have referred to as ha-mitzvah, or et kol ha-mitzvah, the entire commandment in the singular, speaking about the whole Torah. That is to say that all the mitzvot of the Torah are one unit. Our goal, our challenge, our test, our calling, our destiny, our individual and national purpose is to fulfill God's will. As Moshe summed it up, Parshat Ve'et Chanan, chapter 4 and verse 1, And now, Israel, listen to the decrees and to the ordinances that I teach you to perform, so that you may live, and you will come and possess the land that Hashem, God of your forefathers, gives you. And in Parshat Akev, chapter 10 and verse 12, we read, And now, Israel, what does Hashem your God ask of you? Only to fear Hashem your God and to go in all His ways and to love Him, and to serve Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to observe the commandments of Hashem and His decrees, which I command you today for your benefit. What does that mean exactly, for your benefit? It's not a, a physical benefit. It's not an immediate benefit. The Mishnah, in the third chapter of Makot, states famously, Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashya taught, the Holy One, blessed be He, desired to bestow merit upon Israel, and therefore He gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. As the verse states, Isaiah 42, chapter 20, verse 21, 
For the sake of his righteousness, God desired to increase Torah and to glorify it. Maimonides explains this teaching as follows. He says, and I quote, It is a foundation, a foundation of Torah faith that when a man fulfills one of the 613 commandments properly, without any ulterior motive, but only being motivated out of love for God, this merit grants the man life in the world to come. Thus the Holy Ramchal succinctly defines the mitzvot as the means through which we gain the good for which God created the universe, meaning ultimate connection to Him, which is not in this world. But there really are two sides to the observance of the mitzvot. First and foremost, through their observance, we accomplish tikkun olam, that is to say, doing the divine commandments helps to fix the world. When we observe Hashem's commandments, it helps to raise up all of creation and thus bring the universe closer to its goal and helps bring the redemption closer. But the mitzvot also help a person develop spiritually, help develop one's attributes properly, one's perspective, as well as accruing reward in the future coming worlds, the next world. And simply put, the divine commandments are like conduits through which we are able to fill the world with the divine presence of Hashem. And honestly, I mean, the essence of Torah is the commandments. So everybody knows that there are 613 commandments altogether. There's 248 mitzvot asay, positive commandments, that is to say they mandate certain action. And then there are 365 mitzvot lota aseh, which means negative commandments prohibiting certain action. But since many of the Torah's mitzvot apply to laws of purity and offerings in the temple, which unfortunately we have not yet rebuilt, not that they're not binding upon us, most certainly are, and that's why we seek to rebuild the Holy Temple. And in the meantime, only some 369 can be fulfilled today without the Holy Temple, 126 positive and 243 negative. And even many of these apply to only certain individuals or circumstances. Total number, which can be seen as applicable to everyone under all conditions, is 270, 48 positive and 222 negative. Now, although some of the commandments had been known since the very earliest times, all of the commandments, including their interpretations and detailed laws, indeed every aspect of Torah life and observance, they were all given by God to Moshe on Mount Sinai. As we learned in Exodus 24, 12, God told Moshe, come up to me on the mountain and stay there. I will give you tablets of stone as well as the Torah and commandments which I have written so that you may teach them. And as for the commandments that were known before the Sinai revelation, the seven universal commandments binding on every human being had been given previously to Adam and Noah. These mitzvot prohibit the worship of idols. They forbid cursing God. They require the establishment of courts of justice. They prohibit murder, adultery, and incest, stealing, and the prohibition against eating flesh from a living animal. Later, the commandment of circumcision was given to Avraham, and a law against eating from the sciatic nerve was given to Jacob and laws of marriage and divorce were given to Amram, father of Moshe, in Egypt. So although the Torah also embodied these earlier laws that had been revealed by the Creator prior to the events at Mount Sinai, the Torah's commandments all became instantly and eternally binding at the moment of Israel's acceptance at Mount Sinai. Thus it can never be said, like some people try to say, that Judaism gradually evolved. The way of life of the Jews, Torah, my preferred name over Judaism, came into being all at once at the Sinai Revelation. And the whole concept of the commandments means that Judaism is not a religious philosophy. It is a way of life based on action and observance and not a confession of faith. The Sinai Revelation changed the course of history. The entire nation of Israel accepted the Torah responsibility for observing the Torah through both an oath and a covenant. The oath is eternally binding on all future generations, and the covenant consisted of three aspects. It began with the act of circumcision for all males just before the exodus from Egypt. And secondly, immersion for the entire people just before the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And thirdly, the people brought korbanot, offerings, and immediately following this, they unanimously declared Exodus 24-7, we will do and we will obey. The oath and covenant established a special relationship between God and Israel that would last forever, and nothing would ever change that relationship. Later, in Deuteronomy 29, Moshe states, you are standing 
before Hashem your God, to enter into the covenant and oath that Hashem your God is making with you today. Today He will thus permanently make you His people, and He will be your God as He swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this covenant and oath, but also with those who are not here today. And of course, the mitzvot can be divided into two categories. Decrees, which are chukim, and ethical laws, mishpatim. The ethical laws are essential for the preservation of society. Chukim are commandments for which there is no reason within the realm of human intellect that they can be understood. There's also a third category called edot, testimonies, which are commandments that bear witness. And even when it comes to the chukim, that Hashem tells us about them, that we cannot understand them, we still strive to understand their symbolism. And our sages wax eloquent and explain to us many uh, ideas behind the chukim as well. But the commandments are to be observed because they were given by God, not because logic demands it. So I don't just keep the ones that I understand or feel like I can relate to them. I also keep the chukim, which are above my comprehension, above my pay grade. Imagine, I say to myself, I don't have to understand. Now, that doesn't mean that my willingness to be part of this covenant and keep the mitzvot means that I'm mentally challenged or mentally feeble or that I lack intelligence because I'm willing to do something that I'm told in advance I cannot understand. And there are many symbolic explanations, deep, deep insights related by our sages to why it's prohibited, for example, to wear a garment that contains a mixture of wool and linen. Some of these explanations are so deep, they go all the way back to Cain and Abel and the offerings they brought, and they involve fixing the world. So too, when it comes to kashut, the dietary laws, when it comes to the red heifer, just so many mitzvot that we are commanded to observe because God said so. Because it's not about me <laughs> and my huge, massive intellect. Indeed, the commandments themselves proclaim a higher logic. As Moshe reminds us, observe and keep the commandments, for this is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the nations. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 6. They're also not to be kept because of one's personal taste. You know, the sages taught, for example, a person shouldn't refrain from eating pork and say, it disgusts me. But you say, yeah, maybe I might like to try some, but Hashem said, said no, so what could I do? So open up your heart in the deepest way. This Torah portion of ours, Ki say with its 74 mitzvot, some chukim, some mishpatim. They encompass so much of life and its choices and expanses and experiences, so many possibilities. These 74 mitzvot are sandwiched between two wars. It's so interesting. The parsha begins with the optional war, the milchemet rishut, the war against your enemy, highly individual and personal, the one that you might see that woman in. And the challenge to see holiness, right? That's what the attractive captive woman is all about, as I explained it. And the Parsha ends with the war of Amalek, a war against God himself, constant in every generation, representative of, of all that can go monstrously wrong with humanity, the total obliteration of the divine image, causing God himself to decree. And we read at the end of the Parsha, beginning with verse 17, you shall remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you went out of Egypt, how he happened upon you on the way and cut off all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore, it will be when Hashem your God grants you respite from all your enemies around you in the land which Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, that you shall obliterate the remembrance of Amalek from beneath the heavens. You shall not forget. Whoa. One of the most unique mitzvot in the entire Torah, God's Pardon me, obsession, as it were, for his name's sake, as we learn in the book of Exodus, God's command to utterly destroy not only Amalek, but even its memory. Is there anything that connects between these two wars? The one in the beginning of the parsha and the one in the end? Ostensibly, there's certainly no hidden holiness lying waiting to be redeemed on Amalek. It's a totally different kind of war. And what about the bridge between them throughout our parsha of the mitzvot? How do we understand the whole 
dynamic of the presentation of this Parsha. Well, Rashi states something remarkable about the war of Amalek. He cites a Midrash which points out the verses that appear immediately before Hashem's exhortation concerning Amalek. Verses warning Israel to exercise caution regarding proper weights and measures. The verses state, you shall not keep in your pouch two different weights, one large and one small. You shall, keep in your you shall not keep in your house two different ephah measures, one large and one small. Rather, you shall have a full and honest weight, full and honest ephah measure, in order that your days will be prolonged in the land which Hashem your God gives you. For whoever does these things, whoever perpetrates such, in such injustice is an abomination to Hashem your God. So Rashi states on the words, you shall remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you went out of Egypt. He says, the juxtaposition of these passages teaches us that if you use fraudulent measures and weights, you should be worried about provocation from the enemy. As it is said, it's a verse in Proverbs chapter 11, deceitful scales are an abomination of Hashem. After which the next verse continues, when willful wickedness comes, then comes disgrace. And Rashi explains that means that after you intentionally sin by using deceitful scales, the enemy will come to provoke you into war, and this will be a disgraceful matter. This is the Midrash Tenchuma. Open up your heart in the deepest way. The mitzvot are so powerful. Even something as simple, straightforward, as simply dealing honestly with each other, with honest weights and measures, not trying to make an, an ill-gotten profit. Even something this simple brings the light of Hashem into the world and defeats Amalek. But there's a battle outside and it's raging. When we fail in our mission, the disaster that follows is not God's doing, but our own. We can bring disaster upon ourselves and upon creation in the form of the spirit of Amalek, the aberration of creation, which seeks to plunge the world into darkness and hide the presence of God. This world is so much more than it appears to be. Holiness could be lurking right below the skin-deep surface. Amalek might be just around the corner waiting for us to slip up. It's a very delicate balance that we maintain in our struggle to reflect Hashem's presence and merit to bring His light into this world and uplift all of creation. And that's what the mitzvot are all about.